Good evening and welcome to this Cumberland Conversation with Martin Stanford. And Martin, thank you so much for being with us. And if this is your first experience of a Cumberland Conversation, it's an informal discussion where we explore issues through the life and work of a guest speaker. Martin and I have a conversation about 30 minutes and then we'll move into Q&A. And if you've got a question for Martin, please send it using the Q&A function and we'll finish promptly at uh, 7 p.m. Martin, can we begin by asking you uh, about how you got into the world of TV journalism? Um, Ed, thank you very much indeed for having us along. Um, the TV journalism came second, actually, to radio journalism. Um, I started off, uh, my very first experience of broadcasting was as a sixth former at the local school where I was in Whitney in Oxfordshire. And uh, a group of us were allowed to go in or invited to go in um, to BBC Radio Oxford, the local station that was uh, just a few miles away up the road, up the A40. And I will confess to you that on that occasion, um, the idea of the programme was to try and interrogate the views um, and uh, no doubt test the intellect of the local six formers on one of the big issues of the day. Uh, I have to confess that I think I was the worst, worst guest they probably ever had as the panel. I think, thank goodness, we had some more talkative um, people from my school there. There were about five or six of us, as I remember. I don't think I made a very good contribution. But you know what happened on that day that I think I was bewitched a little by the whole atmosphere of this particular room. Now, Radio Oxford has changed since between then and now, of course, by all recognition. Indeed, it's moved about uh, 600 yards up the road. But at the time, the room was fascinating with its uh, oh-so-quiet atmosphere. A radio studio is a very special place because, of course, they use a lot of soundproofing, so the acoustic is very dead. We sat around a very large uh, circular table, and it was one of those old-fashioned lozenge microphones that was hanging by wires from the ceiling in the middle, and that was able to pick up all our voices. And of course, on the wall, the other great characteristic of any radio studio, indeed any broadcast environment, is a big clock to tell you uh, the time, to tell you how long you've got to go, and so on and so forth. Another feature I remember on that panel was the big red light. And I think I was, as I say, a little bit which taken aback, um, or fascinated rather, by this environment. But I think that was the moment at which a seed um, was sown in my mind that uh, I was going to be fascinated by broadcasting, I didn't at that stage know, to be honest, Ed, that I was going to be um, a front man or a presenter of any sort. I think as a teenager, I'd grown up tinkering with, um, with sound and speakers and hi-fis and, you know, running the school disco and things like that. So I had an idea about the technology involved in audio, but I hadn't uh, really, uh, I suppose, at that particular point, approached the editorial. But from there, um, I mean, the line is, is a familiar one, I think, for a, for a young broadcaster. I worked in various roles. I actually went off um, from that experience at, at Radio Oxford as, a, as an invitee, as a guest, to become a Saturday morning helper, answering the phones, making coffee. You know, those days when unpaid apprenticeships were perfectly allowed. And you learn your business from some of the best broadcasters around. And I was interested in the equipment that they were using. Uh, to control the sound and how the blend of a sound worked and things like this. So that was fascinating. I later went off to join Transcription Recording Unit, which is another interesting part of the BBC, having been trained by then as a sound engineer. I was on that pathway. Uh, and the Transcription Recording Unit, it sadly no longer exists, but at that point, I think they market BBC Wares in very different ways then. But at that point, programmes, um, particularly Radio 3 and Radio 4 programmes, for instance, the panel game Just a Minute, uh, still going strong, of course, even now. Um, but at that time, so we're talking early 80s, uh, for many years had been recorded, of course, and transmitted on Radio 4. But it was then repurposed and used to earn some money for a branch of the BBC World Service. But you had to take out because you had no idea what time these programmes were going to be broadcast in other radio stations around the world. The editing process had to be quite severe. It couldn't be half an hour. It had to be about 25 minutes. And all the topical references, you know, the current affairs gags or the people in the news that particular week or those particular few months had to be removed. 
So I wasn't the editorial person, but I was the editor. And in those days, we're talking about reel-to-reel -reel bits of tape, a razor blade, and sticky plastic, which you like a form of sellotape, which you used across the join. And I found that a very rewarding job doing those audio edits. Of course, nowadays we just uh, we just use computers and things like that to do this um, just as quickly. But that was quite a skill. Um, that took me then back into another branch of radio after a while um, to BBC Radio Northampton, which is another local station, a bit like Oxford, but brand new in 1982. Um, and after a good few years there, I felt that I thought I'm going to go freelance and uh, try my hand at doing various things and had the um, a slight ambition to get into television. So BBC Southampton, where Radio Solent is, and BBC South is, which is the regional television station, was a, another great place to be where I learned my television craft doing those um, short news bulletins first thing in the morning. And just to complete the story, because I feel I'm going on a bit here like no guest <laughs> really should, um, we then went from there to the new satellite station, BSB, which you may remember was a forerunner to Sky or a rival to Sky at one point. Uh, and that then saw 25 years at Sky. And after that, pottering around and I've now ended up back on the radio for LBC. And what about the news dimension of it all? Because obviously, clearly you were you were hooked on the technology and the and the sort of uh, ambience of being in a, in, a, in a studio. But what about um, specifically the news? Is that something that's important to you? It is, um, Ed, because it is very much, uh, certainly once one become involved at the regional newsroom in Southampton, um, uh, there's no sort of airs and graces there. The reporters and the presenters are, uh, sorry, the presenters are both reporters and vice versa, if you like. Reporters present and presenters report. So you were, I was learning my te the particular television version of the reporter's craft, which I think I'd got reasonably good at in a radio context then. And I just think, I think there was a moment where, I mean, God bless the BBC, they trained me in all these various ways. And there was then an, a, a very good training course to convert, if you like, if you had essentially technical skills. And the demarcation was quite dramatic at those, in those days. You could then retrain or not, you know, add, add to your skill set by topping up with journalistic skills. And crucially, of course, you know, you need to learn your basics of journalistic law, what you can and cannot say, um, the law that you have to obey, particularly if you're reporting court cases and this like that, things like that. So uh, thank you to the BBC for those courses. But it also struck me, I think, there was a combination of things. I think I discovered that people are endlessly fascinating. Why they do things, how they do things, how some people are really good at that particular skill set, how that opinion comes from this side of the world, how you might expect this person you come across to feel like this about a particular topic, but they surprise you because actually they're, you know, they're from a difficult, different political persuasion. So I think there was a combination of, of um, wanting to discover how people think and then convey that in some way. And I think I will admit that the immediacy of news um, particularly, I suppose, if we leap forward to the days of Sky, which was still very much in its infancy as a rolling news station. The whole idea of rolling news on television was quite new. Um, CNN had done it, of course. They were, the, they, they were the pioneers in all this. But Sky News, um, when it first started it, uh, in 89, was, very, was the first British effort at this kind of journalistic enterprise. And it was the seat of the pants side of it, I think, the very live, all, most, most news programmes, almost all news programmes are done live. And the presentation of those live with the jeopardy involved, with the excitement of trying to tell the story, um, either stories you've prepared and you've thought about all day, or of course the really exciting stuff when something happens just five minutes ago or in the last 30 seconds, and you've then got to try and guide the audience, guide the viewer through what you are learning about moment by moment. I, I found that um, an exhilarating challenge. Perhaps we can just explore that a bit and about the most memorable moments really from your, from your long career. There must be some really interesting uh, experiences you've had. Uh, yes, quite a few, I suppose. Um, the, 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 the studio anchor person, of course, is, is the one where that's where it falls to start the coverage. It's often the case then that you rely entirely for the complete story on your colleagues in the field. Um, 
but often it's you that that has to try and convey those first bits of news. And I suppose, um, I mean, it's sad to re to remember the, the the death of Princess Diana or Diana, comma Princess of Wales, as she was by the time she died. Um, but that was uh, an incident, I suppose, that will stay long in my memory. I wasn't actually on shift, as we know, the accident happened late into the night and I was uh, fast asleep in my bed on that particular Saturday night when my boss phoned up um, and uh, I had the phone by the bedside table and he was very efficient in explaining what he needed. He said, um, there's been a car accident in Paris. Uh, we think Diana's hurt. Dodie may well have died. Can you come to work? Uh, I think it was a rhetorical question there, to be honest with you, uh, <laughs> with the uh, he was he, 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 as was commonplace, as I had done, actually, a few years beforehand, there was a relatively junior member of staff reading the news all night long. So having been woken up and a quick uh, grab, uh, you know, an iron shirt and a, and, uh, a suitable tie, mercifully, in a dark suit, um, I, uh, I went into work and, and then picked up the running of the story. Um, from the young man who was there. And uh, you just do your best, tell the story as it unfolds. Now, remember, in, those, in at the that particular time, this is, this is pre-Twitter and pre-much of, uh, of the internet and, and, and certainly pre-phones uh, on, ca you know, ca sorry, camera phones. Um, so the, the pace at which the story unfolded was relatively slow, but little snippets of information came out the heart-stopping moment for me, Ed, I think it was, and you know, I don't know whether I did a good job describing them or not, but uh, the, after many hours of reporting the story, and I think by then we'd reported the fact that uh, Diana had been taken to hospital, it wasn't too sure how well she was, but um, as is the way of these things, the news agencies provide video from other countries, and I think it was the Reuters news agency who provided some footage of the car on the low loader being removed from the tunnel. And I think that is a moment you do remember. Um, I hope it wasn't heart stopping the sense of uh, I was able to continue uh, reasonably smoothly with my narrative of what was going on. But also in television terms, of course, you don't need to say too much. Uh, the drama is in the pictures and it was clearly evident uh, to anybody who was with me in the wee small hours of that Sunday morning that that was the most hideous car crash and it was a gulp moment really because you thought I wonder if any human being actually has survived uh, that accident well as we know you know uh, a bodyguard did and Diana wasn't actually killed at the scene of the car crash but uh, we understand died later in hospital um, so you're, you're you're aware of the sort of measured moments there's there's a sort of you can't, of course, jump to conclusions until the confirmation comes. And the confirmation about her passing came in a rather roundabout way that night. Um, Robin Cook was the foreign secretary. And uh, as I recall, he was in Malaysia on a foreign trip. And uh, the, the agencies, which I have in those days, a simple computer system in front of me in the television studio, um, and occasionally these, uh, as we call them, the news wire services from Press Association, Reuters, Associated Press and so on and so forth, they pop up onto your computer screen. And one agency filed the Press Association that Robin Cook's plane was not going to depart from where it was now onto its next destination or the next scheduled destination uh, because it is understood that uh, Princess Diana had died. And we, we reported that straight, you know, we, we said that, but you, you do feel the import of saying such an extraordinary thing. Um, here was a young woman I know had been in the news, of course, an extraordinary amount with her, um, her marriage, her children being born, and then all the troubles, the difficulties in the marriage and so forth, and then the boyfriend, and, and how that had become such a big news story to then think that you were reporting that this uh, young woman had now died and in you know, the hideous circumstances of a car accident, it, it was quite a moment. But then we got further confirmation when the British government then confirmed that this indeed was the case. And as we know, that Sunday morning, those people who woke in early couldn't believe it and immediately you know, telephoned their friends and asked them if they'd seen it. And uh, the events of that week then played out. And in terms of being prepared for that sort of moment, it just happen any time. Um, I mean, 
you talked about having the phone by your bed. I mean, do you ha have the suits ready in case you've got to dash into a studio and, uh, and suddenly uh, announce something to the world? I did then, um, and luckily I think I chose a, a sensible one. I mean, look, for male newsreaders, it is still the case that um, a business suit, a white shirt, and a sensible tie is fine. Um, on that occasion, um, as has been the case, if you remember, Peter Sissons got criticised when he was reporting on the Queen Mother's death that he didn't switch to a black tie. Um, most major television stations, and I know the BBC do, and certainly Sky do, um, there is a cupboard somewhere, or a, 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 there is not a wardrobe department per se, as you would for a costume drama, but somewhere within the television station, there is a cupboard where presenters' clothes, both for uh, male newsreaders, female newsreaders, are kept in reserve for such an occasion. Um, and luckily, I'd, I think I'd chosen a suit that worked, and then I think at some point, I'd don't think I went on air with a black tie. That would have been that would have been wrong, wasn't it? We were reporting on a hideous road accident, and possibly injury to a member of the royal family at the time. But no, those those preparations are ongoing. And um, although I wasn't uh, I wasn't directly involved in the moment of the more recent royal death when all of us in the media reported on the Duke of Edinburgh passing. Um, it won't surprise you, I think, to think these are things are rehearsed quite regularly and, and dry runs are done just to make sure that as a broadcaster, you want to make sure these are done respectfully. But of course, you want to do it contemporaneously and, uh, and, uh, and do it well. That's a rather sad example of a, of a highlight, I suppose, in your, in your career. What about something um, more fun, well, as it were? Yeah. <laughs> The, 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 I suppose the downside of news is that news tends to be news when something horrible has happened to someone or a group of people or an entire nation. Um, so there is that side of it. And it, it won't surprise you to hear, of course, that a bit like working, I don't know, in the medical profession in, a, in an A&E or working with the police, there's a certain degree of black humour around a newsroom, which I think is perfectly understandable to get people through. You're dealing with sometimes quite relentless levels of misery. Um, sometimes I suppose there's, there's, there's a, the, it's not as dramatic, it, the, there can be some drama, but the things that are at stake are not so great. Now look, there's, a, the, the, there's the difficult subject and unpleasant subject of Michael Jackson was on trial, if you remembered, on child molestation station charges. Um, a showbiz story, you might say, a serious, potentially serious criminal offence. Um, now, this is, a, I was flown out to uh, California to deal with the end of that trial. And herein lies, I'll cheerfully admit, uh, one of the awkward bits of, of television at the time, and this, thank goodness, has calmed down. But there was a fashion at one time, and the BBC and ITV and everyone were as guilty of this as anywhere, that if the story tipped over some kind of Richter scale, the boss always wanted not only the reporters to report from California and, you know, bring in some legal experts from California and all this kind of stuff, but also to send your presenters out to where the story is as well, to give it that extra clout. Now, if I'm absolutely honest, Ed, and I'm not involved in these things anymore, so uh, I, I suppose I can say this, it occasionally was a more, I think, as a, as a televisual device than absolutely necessary. I mean, the fact that I could, as I did that day, when Michael Jackson returned to trial to hear his, the outcome of that, when he'd returned to court, I should say, to hear the outcome of his trial, there was about an hour which we got warning that he was going to leave his Neverland ranch. And if you remember, and I think this is one of those things for a rolling news station, um, a helicopter chase or a helicopter coverage of car movements down roads is sort of go to it. Probably many people watching this might think, yes, I know they do it far too often and it's ridiculous. Well, in this case, I suppose it was relevant because he had to make about an hour, 45 minute hour long journey from his home back to court to hear the outcome of that particular case. And I've been flown out there. But, you know, I spent most of the time I was sitting on a roof, I think, of a building. I was several feet away from the reporter, um, the correspondent who'd been out there for three months covering the trial day in, day out. And it was a huge story at the time. But we spent most of the time, you know, watching pictures 
Um, and I was had a, quite a small, small television set about this. And it's sun, a sunny day or into the evening in California. And you're just trying to find some words to say. And luckily, you know, you, you're, you're furnished with extra guests to talk about, well, it, could it be this or could it be that? But you're essentially just filling time while uh, these quite dramatic pictures of the, of the car and the, and the police escort and the helicopters following him and this kind of stuff, and eventually he, he arrives in court and so on and so forth. Um, so there's a different kind of challenges. But I think, the, you know, to, to, to go back to what I was saying, it, it tends to be difficult things that are going on. I mean, I went out to the tsunami um, this, uh, you know, in Sri Lanka, I actually, as a, the, the Boxing Day tsunami, I was part of a team reporting there from three different nations. Um, and that's journalistically a challenge. Physically, it's a challenge for, for you as a, as, a, as a human being. You know, you've travelled probably a, about a day and a bit. Um, you've then got into rickety old bus, uh, which we've managed to second from somewhere, and uh, landed in Colombo and then went all the way down to Gaul on the coast. And it wasn't until you got about 10 miles away you realised anything had happened in Sri Lanka at all, because it was very localised. Um, but again, you know, you are trying to meet the challenge of reporting that story, but essentially you are reporting on human distress. There was, a, there was not mercifully not too much death, but there was a lot of destruction of, uh, of houses and livelihoods and everything else. And then you have the strange juxtaposition, I have to say, Ed, is that when you do that, they've managed, meanwhile, after you've done your first sort of day or bit of reporting, um, some young producer has managed to find a place for the whole team to stay and get a bit of rest. And uh, the only place we could stay in at that particular was a nice five-star hotel, which was fully working. And you feel um, more, than a, more than a little guilt trip of going to have a comfort of a, bit, a bite to eat and actually a very comfortable bed, and then you go back into telling the story of uh, the difficulties that the Sri Lankans were facing at that time. And we think of um, reporters being in very, very uh, dangerous situations. Have you ever been in a dangerous situation? No, I can't claim that, really. I mean, I'll tell you one story where um, I suppose there might have been an element of risk, but I, uh, the war reporter or the conflict reporter is a breed apart, Ed. And I do not have the DNA, I do not have the gumption, I don't think I have the intelligence and nor the daring do um, to, to fit that bill. Um, so I'm more than happy to, uh, to confess to that. Uh, the one occasion, again, we were sent as, uh, the story was big when the Lebanese and Israelis were having one of their quite routine spats. Um, and it was a period of time quite difficult um, with the Syrians threatening to get involved and everything else. And I'd been allocated the job of going to Israel and northern Israel, Haifa itself, was coming under occasional attack from these Katusha rockets. Uh, when I say attack, I mean, they are fearsome looking things. And of course, if they land on you or within 10 feet of you, they will kill you. But above and beyond that, I mean, if you're 25 feet away, if you're certainly a block away, you know, you, you just hear a loud bang. Um, we were broadcasting as, uh, you know, is often the case. It's interesting in Israel, actually, when, when these rockets were being aimed in, they did ask us when we were broadcasting the, the uh, Israeli authorities, can you frame the shot? Um, obviously, you want to see the presenter is in location, but you don't want too much of a wide shot because uh, as with case with international broadcasting, and I was working for Sky at the time, and they were seen, you know, all over Europe, and you could pick up the signal in Israel as well. Um, th there was a concern that if the shot was too wide, that the people who were chucking these Katusha rockets and actually, you know, winding up their sights and adding another degree or two here and tilting it round by another degree there, were actually using the television pictures as sort of try and aim their rockets at the key targets they were trying to hit. But, you know, they, they were unsuccessful. I was broadcasting live when one of these things went off. I think it was probably 100 yards down the road and it did make an awfully loud bang. Um, Ed, I don't know if I'm proud or ashamed to say that I didn't swear. I came out with a rather <laughs> British understatement of, oh, my word. And then <laughs> remembered that I was supposed to get down on the floor and sort of sank out of shot in a rather sheepish fashion. So I'm not a war hero, not at all. You've just answered the question I was about to ask you, your response. Let's move on to um, a different 
uh, topic now because over your career, you've seen the advent of the internet yes. and we're living in a very uh, different world, I guess, than, uh, than a generation ago. What impact has this had on TV and radio news reporting, do you think? Well, I think it, it, it was an, it's been a seismic impact and it has um, in many ways changed the landscape and in some ways made the job easier and in some ways made it harder. It's made it easier in that the speed of information and the number of sources of information, of course, have multiplied, um, perhaps exponentially. But, you know, that's also raised a new challenge because you don't know the veracity of that information and you don't you cannot necessarily check that information. So let's take a classic example of Twitter. It has become as a social platform um, almost de rigueur for journalists to use and there in of itself is potentially a problem because it's basically the journalistic fraternity, the, the governmental fraternity, the press and public relations fraternity, perhaps just in some you know, rather unpleasant echo chamber talking to itself. Of course, there are, there are regular human beings on there. And you, if you enjoy Twitter, if you enjoy reading what people are saying about this, that and the other, that's absolutely fine. But as a broadcaster, um, I suppose I would say life was easier when there were fewer sources of information. I mentioned the Press Association and its ability. I mean, they still call them wires in those days when it used to be ticker tape and everything else. But sources of the Press Association will publish a story. And as a journalistic measure of credibility, any broadcaster will then report that. They'll happily, as we say in the trade and the newsroom, you'll go with that story or that element of the story. So-and-so has resigned. This has been appointed to be the new minister. The Press Association, if you like, a gold standard. Similarly, Reuters News Organization, Associated Press. Similarly, there's um, AFP is the French version and so on and so forth. And uh, there's a sort of tier of value about these things. Now, Ed, there is a multitude of information coming out here. There are Twitter posts. Well, is that just because they've got a blue tick on their Twitter name, does that mean they're reliable? Or does that mean they're just pushing a particular agenda? Um, there are sources of information where people will put video out, of course. There is acres and acres of video on almost any and every subject all the time. And so now, um, you know, they call the, the, the top people in a, any journalistic endeavor the editor of the day, you know, the editor of your program or the editor of your radio station or television station. Well, editing this down, sifting information now is a real challenge. I, I think we're net, net better off with the Internet and the, and the multitudes of information, but it is raised as many challenges, presented as many fresh challenges, I think, as the paucity of information did, you know, 10, 20 years ago. Uh, it's fascinating. We'll probably pick up a bit more on the internet a bit later on. Uh, just moving to um, another question. I mean, you work primarily uh, in the independent broadcasting sector, but you, of course, you yeah. you started out with the, with the BBC. Um, what difference, if any, are there in the way that news reporting uh, takes place in the independent sector and in public service broadcasting? Um, I think. There is very, journalistically speaking, there is very little. I think the standards in British journalism, and I know I would say this, wouldn't I, seeing as I've worked in British journalism or British based, Britain based, uh, English based journalism for all my life, um, is, is pretty good and they're similar. Now, what is the difference between them is that the BBC's resources, and I've done a few shifts there for the BBC World Service and things like this you know, since I became freelance back in 2016. Um, the resources of the BBC are huge, and this comes down purely to the number of people engaged in the endeavour. Um, uh, the BBC has an envy. It is truly a global news organisation. You know, they have a big staff based in London, around the regions and around the world. Now, when you get round to a very small town or city in, oh, I don't know, choose a country, Brazil, you might find that it's not actually a BBC staffer, but it's a freelance journalist who is paid maybe a little bit of money to work first for the BBC and so forth. So they're a freelance or a stringer, as the, as the term is often used. You might find that the person 
who wrote that story about that small town in Brazil, and it's popped up on a Reuters news agency wire, is actually the same person who works, you know, part time for the BBC. So the BBC has got scale. And I think it's got institutional caution. So that even when the BBC, and they very quickly, once Sky News got underway, they said, oh, we'll have a slice of this, thanks. We're going to have a rolling news channel as well. And it launched as BBC News 24. It's, it's morphed now into just BBC News. Um, and they've got their own partnership, uh, an equivalent channel to CNN International with BBC World. Um, now, BBC World is, its critics will say, it's a rather, rather pedestrian, it's rather dull. But it's very informative. It's very well done. And it's, you tell you what, it's absolutely authoritative. So, authoritative. so I'm honoured to have worked for that organisation and I hope picked up, you know, sort of a gold standard in, in how journalism can be done. In the independent sector, what is there? There's possibly, well, there's fewer people for a start. So the manpower levels are less. And that can be beneficial and problematic. Problematic possibly because you haven't got the resource in depth to know about every subject or to deploy vast numbers of people to every story that breaks. Um, it can be beneficial in that the news is about immediacy and decision making when there's you and one other person or maybe you and one other, you know, a couple of colleagues to decide, shall we say this next? Shall we move this story around and cover this item next? You can do it just like that. And the ultimate end is my next is the job I do now, which is um, a job for LBC's rolling news station, LBC News, where the person who decides what I'm going to say next is me. <laughs> so that, that's really efficient uh, in terms of you're not employing too many people. But, you know, I admit there is inherent weaknesses in that as well. I have to be cautious and I will have to wait until I can get assistance on this matter or that matter or suggest that that fact is checked whereas a bigger organization you know can know that that next item is true right away so i think journalistically to answer your question i think there is a great deal of similarity and i think the asp the standards or the uh, the standards to which we all aspire are very similar across all environments but the actual delivery and maybe the pizzazz and i think i'd have to say the jingles are better in the independent sector And we've been working um, out very closely for the past couple of years, and perhaps um, you could explain to those who've joined us this evening um, what you've been up to here at Cumberland Lodge. Well, I was uh, delighted to uh, be part of a conversation which said, well, what's the next stage for the Lodge? And remember, this is all pre-COVID, and um, of the uh, conferences and the events you host there, is there some value to be had by... I think the initial conversation was about video. Let's capture them in video. So uh, members of the public, friends of uh, Cumberland Lodge, um, who are interested in the work, could maybe can't make a particular occasion. Well, let's make sure we make a video recording. And my contention was um, in this world, which I've alluded to a bit, where there is so much information available online, that you, uh, I believe, you don't want to do this half-heartedly. Luckily, the ability to record good quality video and importantly, actually, for both radio and television, good quality audio is now not as astronomically as expensive as it used to be. So to capture a session, you've got a star guest coming, you've got a panel of speakers who are going to quiz them, and maybe you've got an audience who are going to pipe up and ask some questions. Do you want to capture that? You know, if you do it on a Wednesday evening, um, at six o'clock, it's there and then, you know, the, the audience in the room enjoyed it and maybe they'll tell their friends. Wouldn't it be great to try and capture that and maybe give the opportunity to someone who's going to do it? I think the conversation we went, well, let's try and do that well. Let's use good quality cameras. Let's use proper microphones and make a good fist of it. And then, of course, we let um, for the natural progression from that was and our conversation started pre-COVID, Ed, as far back as that, if we can remember then, um, <laughs> that wouldn't it be fun to, to, to at least look at the possibility of this thing called streaming? Well, you know, after the year and a half we've had, of course, this has become commonplace. This very medium, Zoom and a live stream, has become absolutely matter of fact. But even as much as two years ago, 
it was still for an organization such as Cumberland Lodge, uh, it seemed a big deal and something potentially unreachable. And I was just happy to be part of the, um, of the team that came together and explored that and said, well, we can't, we can't turn ourselves into a BBC studio or a full on television studio, but we can do something that is akin to that. And therefore that amongst all the myriad of stuff you might be able to watch online, at least this is um, interesting material and conveyed to you and your computer or your iPad in a way that you can recognize the pictures and hear the sound in good quality. Well, I must say it's been a godsend to have put all this uh, equipment in and bring your expertise and indeed bring uh, Jack in, who's uh, behind me in another, another room uh, working on, on all this, because um, when COVID struck, we were already uh, up and running and, um, and we've been able to make use, massive use of the facilities uh, over the last year. But perhaps, Martin, you might just guide, guide us into explaining the kit because, and maybe Jack can help here, because I'm not really sitting in our library and uh, perhaps <laughs> no, Martin, you're you not. can explain exactly where I am sitting. Uh, what I can do is this is my messy study, Ed, and I, I've definitely left it messy in the desperate attempt to look terribly intelligent. But it's actually the fact it's just messy. Um, you, though, are in your study and uh, what looks like a study. But in actual fact, we, we've used a very common technique that's been around in television and radio and filmmaking, indeed, which is the, the infamous green screen. And um, people actually you can do this on Zoom, of course, without a green screen these days. But you're the backdrop. Um, and I think because I'm talking nonstop, we can't see you. So let me ask you to say a few words and we'll see if we can show you where you actually are now, Ed, if you just say a okay. few words. Okay, so I'm so I can see on the screen that I'm that I'm upstairs in the library, but Jack, can we change it around? There so we are. There we are. So now I'm this is what it's really like in here, except what I'm looking at is not green, it's very black because we've got uh, the studio covered in um, black panels for for sound uh, proofing. Now I, well, I've moved into the, uh, the to the drawing room, so we can do that, and um, we can move there. We are tapestry hall. Nice sunny evening out there. <laughs> we uh, we did one of the first things we did um, made it, which was going out live. We made it look like uh, it was a nice sunny day shining in where actually it was pitch black outside and uh, I did have uh, one or two emails saying uh, what was going on but that means the technology <laughs> was actually working really well because it, it, it looked real and yeah. uh, Martin you had to design all these camera angles as well to different uh, shots so you know, in in this room I, I'm now looking at one camera um, but uh, was one two three four cameras in the studio and um and you have to make yes. the camera angles look like they're, they're working in a in a room when you actually got a well, two-dimensional background yes indeed and we, we hope we'll get back in may or may, perhaps june when the government let us put uh, people a little closer together that we'll be able to do interviews and you and i could have had this conversation sitting as, alongside one another um, in that room, but of course, COVID prevents that. But uh, yes, look, I wish I could have predicted how fortunate, um, well, it, it was your call actually, I think, to invest in this particular bit of kit. And there you are, you, you, uh, I'm glad that it's bit proved so useful um, in keeping in touch with people. And it's allowed um, Cumberland Lodge to, uh, you know, to stay in, in so much as it can do, uh, communi communicating with its friends and its audience in this way, which I hope proves uh, proves very effective. It'll be interesting to see whether we've we've all got into sort of video conference call exhaustion. Um, I suppose right now we all would uh, willingly, once we're allowed to, you know, leave our homes and actually go and hear a speaker in a room with other people in order to enjoy the glass of wine afterwards with other with other folks. But I still long think long term for organizations like Cumberland Lodge and then widen that out. I think in there is so much, uh, as I'm sure you've, you've tried it, I tell you what, let me put it in the church context. So um, I know that um, Canon Pole, of course, has been broadcasting for his small congregation uh, using your studios, but churches up and down um, Great Britain, uh, well, around the world to that, to that effect, of course, have, have had to ch up, 
the, with the challenge of, well, what do we do about Sunday services? Can we keep a, in connection with our congregation? Well, you know, Zooms or uh, these kind of events are one way to do that. I would just argue that if you're going to do it, it y y your audience, it, if it's at all possible, deserve a good quality delivery of whatever it is, whether it's a lecture, um, whether it's a talk, whether it's a presentation for a company uh, to its own staff, whether it is a church service. It's, I think, more effective if you can try and up the production values to as far as is, as is reasonable, to, to whatever you can reach. And it's worth making the effort because I think um, there is too much stuff which, it, which is inaudible or the pictures are really dull. I mean, bless them, one church I've, I've seen has done a church service. It's clearly just an iPad, um, you know, propped on, I don't know, a table or something right at the back of the church. Well, they'd, you know, God bless them. But it's inaudible. I can't really hear what's going on. And the shot never changes. So it's unwatchable, too. With, with that in mind, as we're not the BBC, I'm going to do a dreadful plug and advert now to say that I mean, if there's anyone that's watching this evening who needs good quality facilities or knows anyone who would benefit from good quality facilities, maybe an organisation or something, we are um, going to be hiring out these facilities here uh, at the lodge. And we will leave some details at the end in case anyone wants to make an inquiry about uh, that. But let's now move on to some questions that we've had uh, that have come in. And... Um, we have a question here from Mark Cross, who's asked, if there is one person in the world that you have not interviewed or would like to uh, interview again, who would it be and why? Uh, now, this is an easy one, Ed, and that would be Her Majesty the Queen. I'll never get permission to do it because I'm sure she will, uh, uh, she will leave us when her, time is when her time is nigh or when she's ready to go without giving interviews to anybody. But I would find um, I, I would find her take on the world, her life and times, utterly fascinating, and not, I mean, you know, as a, as a woman, as a mother, as a grandmother, she's had to put up with an awful lot, but she's also had, uh, in the truest sense of the words, a unique viewpoint on ninety plus years of history. Uh, and what a story and what a conversation that would be to have. So that's a relatively easy one to answer. Well, there we are. And um, going right back to when you were talking about Dinah, were you, were you nervous when, uh, when that happened? Um, you're not nervous in the sense of your... On the one hand, you're in a comfortable, you're comfortable doing a job you know how to do. You have a sense, I think, of the import, the magnitude um, of the story and indeed the, the solemnity that you hope you convey uh, without, you know, it was a tricky night's broadcasting that because it was only by around about five, uh, five thirty in the morning that we got the multiple um, confirmations that indeed she had passed away and and then you know you you then have to start uh, paying tribute to her life and times and in the usual way of analysis you have to have conversations with people about well what will happen next and what the consequences might be so in that sense um, you've done that same job of analyzing something that's happened and trying to report it accurately and sensitively um, and develop the narrative as new facts emerge, you're adding that to the storytelling as you go along. Um, so I don't think uh, nervous, no, aware of its sense of consequential, the consequential nature of this new story, very much so. And I think, how, of course, you were, you were immediately very concerned that you did a fair and proper job, which I hope I do any day any, anyway, but you particularly wanted to get that one right. Moving on to another question from uh, Hannah Barry. Hannah is asking, what advice do you have for someone trying to break into the industry? Okay, question I get asked a fair bit, and it's a perfectly good one. Um, now, my route in, which was to become a Saturday tea boy at a radio station, 
uh, is probably still around, but it might be more difficult because so many other people are doing it. Uh, but it's moved up the food chain now, you know, to people who've got right the way through and maybe have got a good degree. It doesn't have to be a media studies degree. I will absolutely say that. But you may want to do, if you've got a journalism, um, quite a common route for young people these days is to maybe go and degree in your in your chosen subject, but then do a postgrad year or something in, in, in journalism or broadcast journalism. And that sets you up. But it is um, it is still the case that I would say that trying to get the experience along the way, uh, that is, if you are at university and there's a university radio station, go and join it or there's a university television thing. Or if you're a, new, you're a writer, uh, news, of course, doesn't have to be through the electronic media at all. Uh, definitely, you would want to get involved in the student newspaper. If you're a, a, a degree younger than that, you know, in the sixth form or maybe at school, uh, there are opportunities there to start. I mean, you know, you almost don't need, I suppose, the professional broadcasters. You might end, want to end up at the BBC or ITV, but everyone's a broadcaster now, Ed, you know, and I don't fully understand this, but my 20-something uh, sons, you know, find following the YouTubers and I'm just in awe of the stuff that they put together. A lot of it is completely inane to me, but then, you know, I'm old, I'm supposed to feel it's inane. But, you know, a lot of it has had an awful lot of hard work put to it and some quite high production values of uh, young people setting up a quiz event or pranking one another or whatever. And there's some really extraordinary filmmaking skills, some clever um, sense of comedy, um, and there's an awful lot of tat, of course, one has to say as well. But the opportunities, I suppose, to self become a broadcaster and just start broadcasting is there as well. Uh, how that tips then into a career, if we've still got traditional media in the sense of newspapers, radio stations, television stations, I think they're going to be around for a while yet. Um, that it's making that jump, I suppose, from, from self-broadcasting and self-publishing into working for someone. I think if you've got a good portfolio to show this is not just another job application, but you're serious about this and you've tried already to become a practitioner, you've already started reporting, you started writing, you started editing, you started telling stories through all sorts of media, um, that portfolio should help you get through the door. I guess going down the sort of the more normal career route does mean you've got a lot of people around you who will give you advice, but also, you know, critique, critique how you deliver, et cetera, et cetera. And you might miss out on that if you're a, a one man band, one person band. <laughs> Yes, I, th I think so. And, you know, uh, if you are minded to work as for a, for a national uh, broadcasters, and I think they will exist for some time yet. I mean, it's, it's fascinating to see how the media landscape is changing. The newspapers are frantically becoming video publishers and they're on the Internet and they're posting clips and things like that. And it's almost like news organisations are merging one into the other in the same way all television stations um, started running their own website and, you know, video clips go up on the website and then Twitter came along and Facebook came along and now uh, LinkedIn comes along and now you'll see a, a, a t what is ostensibly a television news operation has a multi-platform approach to disseminating its content. And that does require multiple skills. Uh, but if you want to work at that national level where the uh, opportunities are extraordinary, uh, the pressure is huge, but the rewards if you enjoy doing it and you enjoy, you know, working uh, literally <laughs> on the edge of your nerves every day for a shift, um, then, of course, the, I think those newsrooms will still exist. I mean, the, the ultimate form of that, I, I, I don't work for the LBC talk station uh, at the moment, but uh, the talk radio station is now into visualisation. So th this, this theory of mine that everybody is sort of cross-fertilising, if you're in newspapers which used to rely on the written word, they're getting to visuals. Now the radio stations which used to rely on the spoken word are now putting all their presenters and conversations on a video feed like this. So it, it's a fascinating area. Uh, and I, I think these... Um, it, it is interesting to see, I suppose, on the sustainability of journalism. At one time, there was a big feeling that newspapers, just out of a sense of the finances involved and the business plan, uh, might cease to exist. 
I think the successful ones have found ways of uh, using these new media and these new channels to raise more money. And so I think their journalistic endeavors are, are secure for the, for the time being. We're running out of time, but I've got a couple more questions that have come in. Going, okay. uh, Mark Cross has asked another question, and it sort of follows on from what you were saying about living on your nerves. I mean, how do you uh, relax? Do you do mindfulness? Are you into meditation? <laughs> or what, what do you do to keep yourself calm? No, I'm obsessed with, well, I'm obsessed is too much strong. I love a boat, um, Ed, is the answer. I, I, I'm like a kid messing about on boats. Um, is is my way of uh, of relaxing. Whether and, and you know I I'm completely agnostic as whatever that is. Um, since I am approaching sort of older age and retirement, I've managed to uh, discover the world of sailing, and I've trained uh, to be a day skipper so I can uh, sort of control a yacht. Though I am still a bit green, and uh, that's still a bit new. That's been a pleasure. I've owned a small. Um, uh, powerboat for holidays and things for a number of years. I used to enjoy narrowboat holidays, haven't had one of those for a while because narrowboat holidays are fantastic, but you know what, it always rains, uh, it, almost irrespective of the time of year you go. But no, to relax, put me on water in something that's going to float and I'm very happy. <laughs> and uh, the final question we've got time for this evening is uh, from uh, Gabrielle Moreno who's asked, what does Martin think about growing public distrust in mainstream news media and journalists and how might trust be recovered? Ed, that's a huge topic um, for, the, for the last minute or so of our conversation, but it's a really, really important one. I'm, I think from the school of thought, which says, hold your nerve. Um, mainstream media is now an insult if you are of the Twitterati who follow this, and uh, politics and others have written about this much more lucidly and much more wisely than I, but politics has become something of um, akin to a boxing match or um, uh, like football teams where, uh, and this I think is only in part of the discourse, but part of the discourse, and it tends to be on, on Twitter as a main platform, Everything has to be a complete win or a complete no, you know, a complete lose. You lost, you were wrong, that guy's out, this guy's in, this woman is dreadful, that person is a hero, um, and everyone's got very shouty. Uh, I was taken by something, and I can't claim credit for this, and I don't, maybe it's not even a, 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 an original thought for him, but Barack Obama, was, had, a, there is a clip, which I thought was very powerful, and he explained this very well. He was asked about his experience of, of being a two-time president. And he said, well, one of the things in the world of politics is you learn very quickly, and actually it's, it's just common sense, is actually most things aren't black and white. There is a whole shades of gray, but the American political system, and perhaps increasingly our political system, means you're not allowed to be nuanced. You're not allowed to say, well, you know, that's a pretty good idea. With a little tweak here, it'll be a good idea. I'll support you on that. You have to be, he's a Tory, she's a Labour, uh, and we therefore absolutely, even whatever the merits of what she's proposing, certainly in the social media world, you're not allowed to have compromise. You are not allowed to admit that the other side might have um, some kind of merit in their arguments. Now, look, Let's not be naive. To, to a degree, that's always sold. And the whole newspaper industry we've talked about um, thus far has been, has always had polarised newspapers. You know, you buy the Daily Mail because you like what the Daily Mail's outlook on life. You, um, Although, actually, the Daily Mail's outlook on life is changing under their new editor quite a bit, I think, on, the, on where it sits in the political spectrum. But you either buy the Times or you buy the Sun or, and things like that. Where I don't think, and this is maybe what our questioner was driving at, will... Um, there, there is a new phenomenon just around the corner called uh, a TV station called GB News. And this is aiming to maybe do more akin to the newspapers, that it'll be a television station that I think probably, what would it be? The Sun, the Mail, certainly, and perhaps the Telegraph readers would be very comfortable watching. And they feel that the regular news at the mainstream media, to use the buzzword, such as the BBC, such as ITV, such as, you know, LBC and its newsroom function, 
are so samey and so safe, and the accusation is they're essentially left-wing. I don't think that's right, Ed. I really don't. I, I don't think that's a fair criticism of them. I think the BBC have a, have a really, really tough job. And in the hours and hours of output, it is inevitable that some programmes um, and the way they're put together, because we're all human and a human being sits at the top of the chain and makes the decisions to include this or to make this item two minutes long and this item six minutes long. So there will be some flawed decisions. But I do not see the big conspiracy theory that the BBC or the body journalistic or that all television news is some kind of force for the uh, centre or hard left against the right. As it, it's just nonsense. And I think, you know, th there's an element of you just keep ploughing on doing what you do and you play by the journalistic rules, which I'm very grateful were embedded in me by the BBC uh, donkeys years ago. And I think there is a, that I think we will survive despite all this noise about mainstream media versus everybody else. I think that is probably noise. And I welcome actually the diversity of approach to reporting things. As you know, we have a very um, regulated broadcasting um, system in the United Kingdom and Ofcom is in charge of that. I think we may see, I don't know if it'll be in my lifetime, but over time, maybe the rules on impartiality will be relaxed a little bit. My, the, the, the radio station where I work, but don't actually work on the channel, uh, you know, LBC as a talk radio station, doesn't within every program or every three minutes stick to one point of view. You'll probably get at breakfast time, one particular outlook on politics and by half past 10, you've got another one. And so they mix and match it that way. And so this amorphous middle, uh, it, it, you know, you do get a diversity of opinion. I think that's within reason, uh, that's perfectly healthy. So I, I think, I, <laughs> maybe I hope for a few more years, the mainstream media will keep going. <laughs> Sadly, we need to come to uh, a close. And just to reiterate what I said uh, earlier on, um, that is, if anyone uh, who's watching would be interested in hiring our facilities and or know someone who do, please do be in touch with our meetings uh, and event team. So that's the end of the adverts. Um, thank you, everyone, for taking part. Thank you, especially, Martin, for being such a wonderful conversation partner this evening. And um, just to say that like all charities, uh, we've taken a big financial hit at Cumberland Lodge. If anyone would like to make a donation you're, uh, via the website, please do so. Um, but otherwise, all it leaves me to say again is thank you for joining. Thank you, Martin, and uh, good evening, uh, everyone. Thanks, Ed.